Welcome. Good evening. Uh, I'm Darren from the Tasman District Council Communications Team. And tonight we're here to talk about the Nelson Tasman Speed Draft Management Plan. Uh, our presenter, presenters tonight will be Bill Rice. He's a Senior Transport Advisor for Tasman District Council. We've also got Reese Palmer, who's the Transport Activity Manager for Nelson City Council. And on the side, Felicity Connell, who's going to help us out with any early questions or anything you uh, may want to answer. We're just going to run through the, the rules of engagement tonight. Um, any questions, chuck them into the question and answer session uh, section at the bottom of your screen, you can see there, and we will look at those at the end of it. So question and answers will be at the back end. We can whistle through and um, we'll we'll see what you have to say. But in the meantime, I'll um, hand over to Bill. Bill, it's it's all your baby tonight and um, that'll follow up by Reese. And we'll come back at the end and answer any questions. So, um, Bill, it's all yours. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Darren. And uh, welcome, everybody. It's good to have you here talking about uh, speed management. So this evening, we're covering a little bit and uh, starting off with why, why we talk about speed. What is speed management? What's the process? Some of the feedback we've had to date. And then we'll look at some of the options that we're consulting on. Uh, and Reese will run us through the interactive map and the web page, and then we've got feedback and questions. So just a, a quick overview of uh, of why we're doing this and, and the process that we're going through. So the way that speed limits are set has changed in the last little while, and that was part of the uh, 2022 speed limit setting rule. And so speed limits are no longer set by, by law they're set through the speed management plan, which is then certified by Waka Kotahi. And so Nelson City and Tasman District are consulting on a joint speed management plan, which we propose to bring into force in 2024. And that, that speed management plan, it sets a direction for 10 years and has uh, an implementation plan that's reviewed every three years. And so this consultation is an opportunity uh, for you to influence the way that we set speeds and the speeds that we set within the Nelson and Tasman district. And that is on local roads within Nelson and Tasman and need to, to emphasize that it is not on state highways and the state highway team are consulting on the state highway speed management plan early next year. So why, why are we talking about speed? And it's all to do or mostly to do with safety. And in New Zealand, more people die on our roads per head of population than in other similar countries. And that's partly because our speed limits often don't reflect the nature of our roads. And uh, often if you're obeying the speed limit, you may not have time to react and stop or take evasive action uh, if something unexpected happens. And so you end up with a crash. and and. Yeah, there is some discussion about the cause of crashes, but irrespective of the cause, speed is the key differentiator between walking away from a crash, being carried away from the crash on a stretcher, or being carried away from the crash in a body bag. And so the, the change in speed, a small change in speed, makes a big difference uh, particularly where cyclists or pedestrians are involved. And uh, I'm not sure, for those of you who are, who are familiar with physics, uh, the, the force, the energy involved in a vehicle moving is, uh, is proportionate to the square of the speed, which means that if we reduce the speed by 20%, we actually reduce the energy that needs to be absorbed by the human body in a crash by close to 40%. And so that makes a huge difference uh, to the humans that are involved in, in the crash. And there's plenty of evidence that reducing speed limits has a big impact on crashes and on deaths and serious injuries in particular. And so this, this map shows uh, some locations around New Zealand where speed limits have been reduced and it shows the reduction in deaths and serious injuries as a result of that speed limit reduction. And so looking, looking fairly close to home, the Nelson to Picton route was, or Nelson to Blenheim route was changed, dropped from 100 to a combination of 90 and 80. And the deaths and serious injuries on that route dropped by about 
And even closer to home, State Highway 60 on the Appleby Highway was dropped from 100 to 80. And the deaths and serious injuries on that section reduced by 63%. And if you look around that map, you see that that is repeated fairly consistently right around uh, right around the country with speed limit reductions. So there's some, some really strong evidence that reducing speeds reduces the harm and death that, that happens as a result. And in particular, we are we're concerned about safety around schools. And I guess we all we all know that children are vulnerable. They're impulsive and unpredictable creatures. Their cognitive skills are still being developed, and so they often don't register the speed of vehicles and don't understand the length of time it takes to cross the road. And because younger children are shorter, they're not as visible to, to drivers. And so around schools, it becomes really important to look at slower speeds and all of our options that we are that we're consulting on reduce speeds around schools as one of the, the key drivers for, for what we're doing. So we've got this speed management plan, and uh, there's a, a fairly detailed definition of a speed management of a speed management plan in the left hand side there. But the key key takeouts from that uh, that definition are that it outlines a ten year plan, a ten year vision, with a three year implementation plan. And for us, it does not, as I mentioned before, include the state highways. And that, that square on the right identifies some of the speed management principles that we look at as we're setting speed management plans. And key to that is safety. And so we are trying to set speed limits that reduce the number of fatal and serious crashes. And, and in that process, we may reduce the total number of crashes, but we're most concerned with reducing fatal and serious crashes, serious injury crashes. And we're also concerned about community well-being. And so we try to set speed limits that will enable access to for a variety of transport options for walking and cycling, for options that improve the health of people and improve accessibility and environmental and amenity co-benefits. Benefits. So we're trying to, to make our, our urban areas in particular more livable with some environmental benefits, reduction on in air pollution, and more attractive for people to walk and cycle. The, the third principle is, is movement and place, and, and movement considers vehicle movements, but it also considers uh, pedestrian and cycle movement, so people walking and cycling along the road. And then alongside the concept of movement, we also consider place. So we consider what is happening alongside the road. You know, is it alongside, is the road alongside a school? Is there a school there? Is there a hospital there? Are there shops there? Are there shops on both sides with people crossing across? Is it a residential area with, with people living and wanting to, to walk to their neighborhood shop? So that we, we're looking at both movement and place. And is it a place that we want to have a pleasant environment for people to be? And finally, the, the principle of the whole of the system. And so we look at what we do in addition to changing speed limits. So that includes stuff like enforcement and regulations and a bit of communications and advertising and engagement and monitoring. So all the stuff that goes alongside uh, actually changing the speed limits. So that's, that's what is involved in, in speed management. And so we've, we've developed this draft speed management plan. And as I said, we, we emphasize that the basis of this exercise is to improve safety. And the roads that, that have good safety features you know, such as Wakatu Drive, which has a median barrier down the middle and median barriers on the side, are roads that are safe to travel on at 100 k's. But the international evidence would, would tell us that 
for other roads where we're likely to have crashes, head-on crashes between vehicles, or where vehicles are likely to leave the road and hit power poles, then a speed limit of probably 80 k's is, is more appropriate because that is a, a speed at which occupants of vehicles, if they are in a crash, are more likely to survive. And in urban areas, the, a speed of 30 k's is, is considered to be, be more appropriate because that's a speed at which unprotected people, people on bikes or on foot or on scooters, uh, would survive a crash. And at, at 50 k's, a, a, a pedestrian or a cyclist is much more likely to be killed in a crash. And we also recognize that across our region, we have a wide variety of roads. And, and in particular, we don't have any other roads like Wakatu Drive. And across New Zealand, we have very few roads like Wakatu Drive, where it is safe to, to travel at 100 k's and where head-on crashes are quite unlikely. And, and across our region, we have a variety of roads ranging from the lights of the Ruby Bay Bypass through to rural roads that are unsealed and very narrow and have drop-offs on one side, steep banks on the other. They're windy and steep and are really difficult to travel at 100 k's. And yet we have, at the moment, the same speed limit on those roads as we do on Wakatu Drive. And so one size does not fit all. So we've, we've considered quite a bit of information as we've uh, drafted this plan. We've considered some community feedback and we'll have to talk about that a, a little bit later. We've considered some of the international best evidence and best practice for uh, speed limit setting. We've looked at the, the Waka, Waka Kotahi speed management guidance for safe and appropriate speeds. We've talked to a number of locals and, and we are all locals ourselves. And in particular, we have spoken to our school communities and we've talked to schools. We've asked them what they consider to be important, the speeds that, that they consider are appropriate around their schools. And so we've gone through that process and we have this draft speed management plan, which we are now out for consultation on. And I mentioned the, the, the previous consultation we have done. And back in 2019, nearly 2,000 people responded to a survey on, on speeds. And the vast bulk of those people thought that a speed limit of less than 50 k's was appropriate in town centres and in residential and school areas. And similarly, the vast bulk thought that a speed limit of less than 100 k's is right on the narrow and winding rural and unsealed roads. And most people who lived in rural residential areas considered that 50 k's is, is an appropriate speed in those areas. And so we've taken that, that information on board, that feedback on, on board as we've, uh, as we've produced this plan. And we have we have developed a suite of options for the for the plan that we are consulting on. And and we've done this because we wanted people to have some options to think about. And and because we didn't want to be in a situation where people have come back and and suggested a particular speed for a local environment, which we hadn't consulted on. And our understanding and the advice we'd received is that if that were to happen, we wouldn't be able to implement that different speed without consulting again. So we've we've gone out with a suite of options that we think cover all the reasonable scenarios. And they range from what we are legally required to do under the speed limit setting rule, which is address school speeds and reduce speeds around schools and change the, the speed limits, the 70K speed limits to something else. And so that is that is our option A in the urban area, which is address school zones and reduce them to 30Ks. And that goes through to option D, which is a speed limit that we consider would really minimize the number of deaths and serious injuries right across our networks, or right across our urban networks. 
And we'll talk a little bit more about each of those options. So options B and C sit between A and D. And we'll just have talk a little bit more about, about those options. So option A is the do minimum, and it's 30Ks outside of schools. And the, the speed limit setting rule requires us to use what they've defined as reasonable efforts to have at least 40% of our school limits outside of schools changed by middle of 2024, and all of them to be changed by the end of 2027. And so we've got, and that is what we're proposing in option A. And, and if you look at the map on the, the bottom right-hand corner of this, this slide, it shows Stoke area and shows what we are proposing within Stoke. And if you look at that brown, brown lines are 30Ks. And so we're proposing around the, the various schools, a speed limit of 30Ks and you'll note that that actually extends beyond the, the dotted line, which is the, the zone that the, the rule requires us to deal with. And that's because it just seems dumb to have a, a speed limit of 30 and then up to 50 and then back down to 30 again in a, in a fairly short space of time. So that is that is option A. And, and we have really worked very closely with our schools to talk to them about what they consider to be appropriate at, at their at their schools. And so those dashed lines on that map are variable speed limits. So you see that the it's green underneath the dashed lines, which means that the, the base speed limit remains at 50, but the dashed orange means that it's a variable at, at 30. So, and that would be at school start and finish times. And then option B goes a little bit further with the 30Ks and, and looks at the routes, primarily the routes to school or school neighborhoods, rather than, than just the, the school zones, which are sort of 100 meters either side of the school boundary. And looks at where, where children are likely to be walking to school. And then also looks at town centers. So you note on, on this map around the, the Stoke Center, the speed limit is, is 30Ks as well. And so this, this option builds on the, the, the 30K, 30K school limits and then adds a, a neighborhood and the, the local town center. And we've also added in some uh, early childhood centers where they, are, where they are close to the schools. And option C is, is a little bit different. So it, it goes back to the the 30K around the schools, but then goes to 40Ks in all the local urban streets. So that's not the main roads. It's not Waimea Road or Main Road Stoke or Nayland Road in this instance or the Ridgeway. So those roads remain at 50 and it is assuming that they would then have some protected cycleways on them to, to keep cyclists out of the way of, uh, of motor vehicles. So this is option C, which is sort of somewhere towards the, the, the ultimate that, uh, that the safe and appropriate speed would be, which is, of course, option D. And option D is very similar to option C, except all of the local urban streets are set at 30 k's. And so that is all the environments where, where people live and work and shop, except the main roads. And again, the, the likes of Waimea Road and Nayland Road and, and the Ridgeway in this instance remain at 50. But the assumption is that, that under this option, they would they either currently have some separated cycle facilities or they would have them in the in the future. And so we've gone through a similar process also with the rural areas. And again, we start at the minimum, which is dealing with the schools. And the, the rule requires us to typically reduce the speed limit outside schools in rural areas to 30 k's. We can, however, identify them as a what's called a category two school, at which 
in which case we can have them at 60 Ks for the first three years. But under the rule as it stands at, at the moment, we then need to review that in 2027 and look at reducing them to 30 Ks or to identify why they are safe at the, at the higher speed. And so with that, that is that is our rule option one, the, the bare minimum. And again, we go through to what's identified as the safe and appropriate speed, which is uh, a much more significant changes. So as I said, in rule option one, we are required to address the schools. And in this map, we're showing the, uh, the Lower Mutri area and the Lower Mutri school and the uh, Steiner school there sitting close to each other. And those schools under this plan and, and following discussion with those schools, we're proposing on the Mutri Highway to drop the base limit to 50 k's outside the schools and to have a 30 k uh, variable speed limit at school start and finish times on that road. And similarly, dropping Robinson Road outside the, the route of Steiner School to 60 k's with a 30k variable at school start and finish times. On school road, that, that fairly minor road that runs along the, the frontage of the, the Lower Mutri School, we're proposing a, a 30k speed limit under this option. We're also proposing to reduce the limits on the adjacent roads to 60k's, immediately adjacent. And that's partly because the school has told us that a number of their pupils regularly walk to and from school along the Mutri Highway there. And so there were some concerns about the safety of those pupils on there. So we're suggesting dropping that that uh, limit to 60 k's along there. So that's the, the, the bare minimum option, option one. Option two, again, as, as per the, the urban ones, builds on that. And it we're looking at, at 50K limits in rural residential areas and 60Ks on winding and or narrow unsealed roads. And 80Ks on what's been identified as high risk roads. So these are roads that, ha that have a fairly high crash rate. And as we've looked at those roads, you know, the, the crash rate is, is due to, to two issues pr primarily. One is that there is a high number of uh, of hazards alongside and the road is is not really a, of a great standard and and so people are crashing and that's partly because of the the traffic volumes on there and so we thought about those and and thought that if we do reduce the limits on those roads to 80 k's and we have roads that run off them at 100 k's and we have a sign as you turn off these these roads onto a side road that says 100 k's, that's giving the message to drivers that, that these roads, these side roads are actually of a higher standard than the adjacent roads and that 100 k's is, is safe on these side roads when it's not on the on the more, more mainer road. And so we are suggesting that as part of this, we also reduce the adjacent roads to, to 80 k's because we figure that if we don't do that, there is a risk that we will actually reduce the crash rate on, on these high risk roads and increase it on the other roads. And as part of this, this exercise, the existing limits that are lower than, than what we are proposing will not change and that speeds won't change anywhere else. And in option three, we still have the, the same situation outside the schools and the 70 K is reduced to 60 and 50 or six, we're suggesting 50 or 60 Ks for the rural residential areas, but all the other rural roads would go to 80 Ks as, uh, except for the state highways, which results in a, in a consistent speed limit pretty well across the across the district that all all rural roads are set at 80 k's and option four again takes that a little bit further 
And again, we have the 50 or 60K for urban, uh, for rural, rural residential areas. 70 reduces to 60, the schools drop to the variable 30s. But the unsealed roads then drop to 60, and the winding, narrow, sealed roads also drop to 60. And then all other roads um, drop to 80. And again, I, I, I want to emphasize again that in all of these instances, we're talking about our local uh, Nelson and Tasman roads and, and not the state highways. And so I'll just now hand over to, to Reese, who will run us through the, the website and the, and the maps, and uh, I'll stop sharing. And hopefully Reese can, can start up. Uh, hopefully now um, you can see what we call the Shape Tasman page. So we are um, seeking feedback um, in relation to the speed management plan, principally through um, online means. And I'm just going to spend a few minutes showing you the, the website that, we, that we're going to do that through and how you navigate around. So um, the best way to get there is just to type Shape Nelson or Shape Tasman into your um, Google search engine or whatever search engine you are using. And that'll take you to the page that uh, you're, you're looking at now. Um, and then if you scroll down, you'll see that there's a speed management review here. So that will take you to our speed management page where you'll see this particular landing page. And it has um, a whole bunch of background, much, uh, you know, very much aligned with what Bill has shared with you tonight. Um, on the right hand side, you'll see that we are holding face-to-face um, -face drop in sessions at libraries, at markets. Um, we've been at some AMP shows. Um, so if you want to, you know, continue the conversation beyond Q&A later on um, after this, you're welcome to come and join us at, at any of these sessions between now and, and February. Um, what I wanted to share with you was just a brief recap on what Bill's um, shared with you around um, the urban areas and rural areas. So you'll see here we've got a urban area option. You can click on that link there and it will take you to um, this page here, which summarizes those four options that Bill's just talked about. You can see here for the urban, 30 kilometers around schools and pretty well 50 everywhere else for that urban option through to the safe and appropriate speed with option D. And then if you want to get some more information, um, a refresher from what you've heard tonight, you can click on that, um, that down arrow and you'll get the, the summary that Bill shared with you earlier. And you'll also get um, some pros and cons and costs associated with that particular option. Um, and so you can see we've got that for for all four options in both the urban and rural. Perhaps the most important thing you're going to want to do to enable you to give us um, you know, some, some feedback is to open this map up here and it will take a wee while to load because um, it's a reasonably large map and have a look at where you live, where you typically drive to, to understand the changes that might be occurring um, in, the, in the areas that you, you traverse around. So when you first click on the map, you'll see it's just slowly regenerating on my screen there. That will take you into, um, into Brightwater. And when you first go onto the map, you'll get this key here. Um, and you can see there the, the colors of the lines tell you what the proposed speed limit will be. Um, and if there's a change proposed, it has a black border around it. So we can see here in Brightwater under urban option A that, um, you know, most of the roads stay at 50 kilometers an hour for green, um, but there is a section on Alice Street that drops to 30 and that change is signified with that uh, black border around it. Now, um, what you will want to do is to click on the layer button here. And you can see here we've got the wee triangle that allows you to open up the four urban options and the four rural options. So you can see we're again we're centered on um, on the center of Brightwater under urban option A you can see the 30 kilometer an hour speed zone as Bill was talking to he was using the example in Stoke of just in the map um, in Brightwater and then you can click through the different options using that clicker to see how the proposed changes would look in your 
neighborhood or where you drive to for work. And then I'll just zoom out and you can see the whole of Nelson and Tasman is mapped there. So you can zoom in wherever you happen to live, click through, just let the map regenerate, click through the options to see how the changes might affect you. And the, and the key thing that we're trying to get from this um, engagement, because this is, you know, we've got a draft speed management plan. The whole point of doing this is to understand the community's views. We've got some, we've got some community views from 2019, but we didn't have a great deal of detail around the changes that we would make. We've now got these four options and we're keen to understand uh, what people's views are. And, and here you can see that the state highway is also whited out because this is local roads for Nelson and local roads for Tasman. Um, we'll just go back out of the map, back to that. Just, just before you do that, Reese, sorry, can I, yeah. can I just interrupt? Can you can you just show show us um, what happens when you click on one of the roads? And probably... Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Hang on, I'll just see if I can get rid of this thing out of the way. Here we go. Uh, that's a great point. Thank you, Bill. So if you click on a road segment it will pop up um, some information and you can see here that that section of road is currently posted at 50 kilometers an hour it's what we call an urban connector so a recently important road in our network and under the each each of the options you can see the um, you can see what is proposed maybe if I'll just click on another option that maybe has a bit more ch change and we can see. So Wicker Street again, urban connector, the current speed limit is 50 kilometers an hour. Under option A, it would stay at 50 as for option B, but then under option C and D, it would change to 40. So if you want to drill into your specific street, you can get that detail without having to click through all of the options here. So multiple ways of, of, of looking at the information. And as I said before, you can zoom around the whole district. Um, to see, um, to see the the, cha the changes that we're proposing under the four options, and we want to hear effectively whether you have a preferred option, and especially under um, this urban option B, whether you think we have the zone size right. You know, we've talked to the schools and we've got an indication from them what they think is important in terms of how big that zone should be, um, and then we've added in where we see all the key activities around town centres and hospitals and things to make up that um, urban option B area that is 30 kilometres an hour, but we really want to understand what the community think about the size of that zone. Um, I'll just go back to, the, uh, back to the main page again. So you can also see on the right here, the timeline where we're in the, in the midst of community consultation and that'll be running through to the end of February. Um, we will then be collating feedback and we then sort of summarising all of the feedback we've heard and be putting this to um, the Regional Transport Committee, which is made up of elected officials to make a final decision on an option or combination of options potentially um, that would go forward into the actual speed management plan. Um, the principal way that we would like to receive your feedback is through this blue button here. And that will take you to a uh, feedback form where you'll be asked to select which option or options you like. Um, as I mentioned before, whether we've, you think we've got the size of option B, the area right, um, and some other questions. We've also got a few common questions here, um, which you can go in and have a read of at your leisure and some myths and misconceptions. Um, just around speed management. And then there's a whole bunch of other useful documents and, and links and, and, and videos on safe speeds. So I'll hand now back um, back to Darren and I think uh, we'll now be going heading into, into the Q&A session. Yeah. So I'll stop sharing. Thanks, Reese, And thanks, Bill. Awesome stuff. A couple of questions there at, at the moment. Um, first up from, from Rob, as I understand the proposal, there's no option to retain the current speed limits. All options require agreement to reduce speed limits. Is that correct or can we stick with the status quo? So the speed, yeah, th thanks Rob, that's a, that's a really good question. So the, the, the speed limit rule, speed limit setting rule requires us and has some specific rules requiring us to reduce speed limits outside of schools. 
and and also to change 70 and 90 kilometer an hour speed limits. Now we have no no 90s in, in Nelson and or Tasman. We have a couple of 70s that, that we're proposing to reduce. So under the rule as it stands, um, that is what we're required to do. Now there there has been some talk from the incoming government that they are proposing to change that rule, but the rule as it stands at the moment is is still uh, is still indicative. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Um, another quest, question from uh, Jeanette. Um, she says, and think, uh, I think in response to what you just said, re option B and other choices, what would help her understanding is knowing what kind of difference there would be in injury and death rates between that and other options. Do, do we have that data? Can, can we answer that? We we don't at the moment, and it, it's, it's really difficult to to um to quantify that um now waka kotahi he have done some work on the the safe and appropriate speeds but not on the on the other combination so really all we can say is that that the change in deaths and serious injuries would be somewhere between each extreme and i know that that's not terribly precise but it is really quite difficult to to quantify those, those sorts of numbers yeah, sure thing. Uh, another question from Rob. Just yeah, this is um, why did Bill use examples of Nelson to Blenheim State Highway Six, Appleby State Highway Sixty, Walker to drive State Highway Six, and then repeatedly say state highways aren't considered? Can you please provide some examples of relevant roads where reduced speeds uh, limits reduce fatalities? I mean, do, yeah, the local roads. Um. Yeah, we don't have recent information on those, um, and and certainly that uh, that that slide that we showed was was produced by uh, by somebody who was looking at at some national speed limit changes and and was really looking at uh, the state highways in particular. Um, but we can we can assume that the the, the changes in deaths and serious injuries would would be consistent when we change our roads from, from 100 to 80 and may even be be higher because typically our local roads have more hazards on them than, than state highways typically do. Yeah, I can add a wee bit to that. That slide also included um, speed reductions in the, at the centre of Wellington. Now I realise Wellington centre is possibly quite a bit different to our centres, but they did a combination of speed reductions from 50 down to 40 and 30, and that showed um, a 38% reduction. And similarly in Christchurch, around the, the central city area, they dropped from 50 to 30 and had a 46% reduction in death and serious injuries. So there's some examples there from sort of central Christchurch and central Wellington um, that, you know, reflect that busy um, central city environment that we have, you know, in the, in the centre of Richmond and the centre of Nelson potentially. Yeah, thanks, Reese. Hey, another quick back from um, from Jeanette. So, in terms of decision making, is part of the decision making then about how much speed reduction people can actually tolerate, as much as anything? I mean, yeah. What's your thoughts? Yeah, part of it. Part of it is to do with yeah how much people will will observe the the, the speed limits and. Yeah, how much, as you say, people will tolerate how 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 acceptable it will be to our communities is is really the the big question that we have. Um, we can we can propose the the technically correct uh, process, but it is up to our communities to decide whether that is uh, that is acceptable for them and and if that's something they they're willing to to accept. Yeah, yeah and just back with Jeanette. Um... On, on this one, she's guessing that there could be, a, is there a graph or the curve that shows the point where ideal speed would be, i.e. below wouldn't make too much of a difference, you know, that that that, that speed damage curve? Um, not, I'm not sure. I haven't, I haven't seen that in terms of the, the impact that, that, that you have. I mean, any reduction in speed reduces the, the energy that's, that needs to be absorbed by 
by the humans that are involved. And so the, the bigger the reduction, the, the bigger the reduction in, in energy. And, and as I said, that's proportional to the to the square of the speed. So if you drop the, the speed by 20%, you get close to a 40% reduction. Um, yeah. yeah. Maybe if I can just add to that and um, share my screen very briefly. Um, on the website, we have this graphic here, which shows the, uh, I guess, the, the damage potential of of a crash with a pedestrian at certain impact speeds and there'll be similar um similar tables and graphs that you can find for you know head-on speeds um in terms of... there, um, you get a, a oh, sorry. Oh, yep. i have need to finally hit the button. beautiful thank Apologies. you <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah we have we have this particular graphic on our website um that shows uh the i guess the car versus pedestrian crash and the and the the likelihood of a death or a serious injury or a slight injury depending on the speed there's very similar graphs for you know vehicle on vehicle head-on crashes um so yeah that kind of effectively shows that uh that injury or death potential Mm, mm, good stuff. Hey, a question from Linda. Um, they've got specific concerns about the local stretch of Noodorf Road near Price's Corner. Although they haven't seen any bad accidents outside their property, they've certainly seen a lot of near misses. Is there scope in the plan to address local concerns like theirs? And that and that's the whole whole point of this, isn't it? Yeah, and, and certainly uh, as we go through the consultation. Um, there are some some text boxes, and we would encourage people to to put specific concerns in there, so so that we're aware of them and and can address them. And we would certainly be be looking at at addressing those specific concerns. Yeah, Barbara asks. Um, you don't mention the effect of reduced emissions with lower speed, uh, referencing the AUT's Gilman study. Safer speeds that is thirty kilometers would surely uh, incentivize active transport. Um, why is the effect of emission reduction not being highlighted, given that we live in a rapidly overheating planet, significantly contributed by vehicle emissions? Um, surely the 4D is, is, no, uh, is a no-brainer. I, I, I don't think we're actually looking at emissions in this, but I, there's a consequence there, isn't there? There is, yeah. Um, and And the... The, the, the science isn't straightforward in terms of the the, the reduction in speed impact on, on emissions, but certainly, as you say, we it would encourage some um, or some more use of pedestrian or walking and cycling rather than than, than traveling by car, which would obviously reduce emissions. Um, we we are looking primarily at safety, but but yeah, the emissions are a significant part of of the equation as well. You know, guess you just, to, just to add to that, um, encourage people to go into the website in that section where I talked about the pros and cons, and in there under each option, we do discuss things like that, like the the emissions reduction, which you know, in the rural options would be more significant than the urban options, but in terms of um, encouraging active modes, um, that's also discussed in the pros and cons under the urban. Yeah, good stuff. Thanks, Reese. Um, Jeanette also comes back with, um, is this more about becoming wiser as a community and as a whole, experimenting with reducing speeds to see actually what happens as a good experiment to gather data for the first time? Uh, yeah, is it an experiment? I'm not, I'm not sure that I'd describe it as an experiment, but certainly you know, there, there is lots of evidence that reducing reducing speeds reduces harm. And so, you know, the, the idea of reducing speeds may not be an experiment, but may, you know, if we re do reduce the speeds and we do reduce harm, then that may convince people that that um, that, that is a, a valuable way to go. Yeah, indeed. Here's a bugbear of many drivers. Melissa asks in it, Areas where 100k limit have dropped down to 80k's are still drivers who travel at 60 to 65k's. This causes immense frustration. Is there any way? How can this be resolved? <laughs> uh, that old chestnut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, driver behaviour is a, a fraught area um, and and very challenging. Um, 
and yeah, and and sometimes it is appropriate to travel at a speed that's lower than the speed limit. Um, and yeah, some people feel comfortable at the speed limit, and some people don't. It's yeah, very very challenging. And yeah, don't don't have an easy answer to that. No, there's that perception of I own the road I'm driving on. It's all mine, isn't it? A uh, bit of selfishness in some states. Um, and, and back with Rob, um, is there data on the proportion of serious injuries caused by drivers that that are actually exceeding the posted speed limits? There is there is some some data on it. Um, and it's it's often often difficult to tell after the crash what what the speed was that the, the drivers were travelling at, and and I guess that there are sort of three three categories. There's, there's people who are exceeding the speed limit by a significant amount and doing stupid stuff, and and that results in a crash. There are people who are generally obeying the rules, but just make a simple mistake, and and that results in a crash. And there are there are a very small number of crashes which are are just simply unavoidable. And and as I said, that's a, a very small proportion of the um you know of the of the situations. There was the the, the crash recently in the last week or so in Hawkes Bay, where a driver drove into or was taken out by a, a slip coming down and, and across the road and, and wiped the car out. Now, that is simply unavoidable. There is nothing that that driver could have done otherwise to, to avoid that crash. But, yeah, the, the proportion of those, of, of those various scenarios are, are difficult to tell after the event. Um, you can make some some estimates of what speed a vehicle was doing prior to the crash um and and you can identify if if the, the speed was crazy fast and you know if, if the speed was up around the, the 200 kilometers an hour as has been identified in a, in a recent coroner's report um that that is is obviously way too fast but if you if you're doing the difference between you know 100 and 120 is, is difficult to actually quantify. Yeah, indeed. It's tragedy anyway. Um, we're going to have to wrap up very soon because our time's going to run out on our Zoom booking. But um, Jeanette's back with us. She's worked in ED, the emergency department, so definitely understands about reducing speed. But what she's trying to nut out here is in terms of making a decision between urban options, e.g. 30 versus 50, which is a major change, how much change in injury or death could be predicted? So she's looking at trying to quantify that. Is there any actual data from anywhere on this, or will we have to find out if we try it and you know and see what happens? It's that that suck it and see thing, or you know what's yeah. been quantified here. And and certainly, if you look at that that slide that we showed earlier about the 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 different environments, there is quite a quite a wide variety of um of change in, in crashes with, with speed limit reductions. They are all positive and they're all very fairly high, but in terms of quantifying it, it's really quite difficult. And back to that slide that, that Reese showed that showed the likelihood of survivability at um at different speeds. At and I can't remember those numbers off the top of my head, but but it's about 10% survive, sorry, 10% likelihood of, of being killed at uh, at 30 k's and about 75 percent at at 50 k's and the other the other thing to throw into that equation is that if you're traveling at, at 30 k's and somebody steps out in front of you 20 meters in front of you you can come to a complete stop in those 20 meters if you're traveling at 50 k's most drivers would have not got their foot on the brake within 20 minutes, uh, 20 meters. So they would hit that person that stepped out in front of them at 50 k's rather than coming to a complete stop. So it does make it does make a huge difference. And yeah, you know, I'm struck, and I'm sorry that we can't actually come up with anything more more definite than than huge. <laughs> um, but that's the that's the reality of um, of where we're at, and and part of that change in 
in the the statistics is, is partly due to how how well the speed limit is observed um and and that is dependent on a whole lot of other variables like the how straight the road is and the, and the nature of the road and, and those sorts of things great stuff well thanks for that guys um it looks so the the questions have, have, have ended now and we're going to run out of time very shortly but i mean what i can emphasize is um anyone who's in the room tonight have you say leap on the website it's all there there's there's a lot to absorb there's a lot of great information and you can provide your feedback or to try and steer our plan into the future so that's at shape tasman.govt.nz or shape nelson because nelson's shape page also links through to that shape nelson.govt.nz so thanks for your input thanks for your questions really appreciate that thank you bill thank you reese and um, we'll have a recording of this up so you can refer back to it as well. And I'll put this on the website, hopefully tomorrow, once it gets itself um, all, all organised. But um, from us uh, at, at the um, at Tasman District Council and Nelson City Council, thank you very much and um, good night. <laughs>